when did you start making this film and um, how did it get started? Well, Nam June called me up again and said, uh, could I meet him at uh, this place on Mercer Street? And he said he wanted me to do a documentary on the TV lab. And this was uh, late summer of 98. And we uh, actually then started in, I think, November of 1998. So it was, but the irony is we actually started earlier. The footage, the oldest footage of Peg Studio, which was on Grand Street, was from 1991. And Peg called me up one day and said, come down and interview these people. <laughs> and there were all these people I knew that I worked with, Carol Brandenburg and John Godfrey and um, Russell Connor and uh, Bob Kotlowitz has since gone, who's the program manager at 13. So um, that's how we actually started before we started. If you know what I mean. <laughs> and it's been a long time. And other things have happened. I mean, I taught documentary film at NYU and Columbia and Dartmouth. And uh, I made a, a film in 2003 that was kind of an accidental film called Sit at 90, which played at about 25 uh, Jewish fest film festivals and others, uh, about an actor and comedian who was in every aspect of show business of the 20th century. But I kept coming back to this. And you see all those credits of. Um, student interns, <laughs> mostly, who did editing and fundraising and research and promotion. And they were from Sarah Lawrence and Dartmouth and uh, Columbia and NYU and, and elsewhere. And some people actually found me. Uh, there was a young woman from Vienna who found me. And there was somebody else from uh, England who found me. And they, they were interested in the subject matter. And I felt that uh, it's, it's subject matter that's hard to find in, in a lot of uh, university programs because they teach film studies, but they don't teach video studies or, or video art that much. But, and yet it's everywhere. I mean, at that time when Peck was doing it, a few people were doing it. But now uh, it's in every gallery. And, and artists, just like they would paint a picture and do a sculpture and, and, and make a print, they would also do video now. How did you meet Nam Jung Pai? You know, I met Nam Jung when uh, a friend of mine who was uh, promoting a book called me up and invited me to this event. I was at Channel 7, Eyewitness News. Mm -hmm. Or maybe it was even before Eyewitness News. I think it was before Eyewitness News. Uh, the big news with Murphy Martin and Bill Dutel. Anyway, I, uh, um, it, it, they were promoting a, book, a picture book that was based on the ideas of Marshall McLuhan. And Paik and Charlotte were like the centerpiece for this, uh, this book launch. and. Um, Anyway, uh, and I think it was right before they got arrested for, you know, mm -hmm. because when Pick asked me to make Topless Cello of Charlotte Mormon, we had these footage, this footage of Bill Butel narrating Charlotte's arrest. And I probably did the story because I don't know if anybody else was interested in the story at the time. So that's probably what it was. But I, I would, he would, this was before he was represented by Holly Solomon uh, Gallery for many, many years uh, who got to know. and. And uh, he was represented by Nadia Bonino at Bonino Gallery. And I went to his, uh, in 1969, I went to the uh, Howard Weiss Gallery's um, TV as a creative medium mm -hmm. and shot some footage there. Great. Um, you have very extensive, extensive experience in the TV industry. You have actually produced quite a number of uh, TV news programs. Right. Um, like the Bill Moyers Journal, the McNeil Lair Report, 60 Minutes, mm -hmm. a lot more. And um, I'm wondering, back in the days, how did you react to the news programs that's produced by TV Lab? And did their practice influence your work? I think it influenced everybody's work. Um, you know, Fred Friendly, who was the president of CBS News, said television then was writing like uh, with a one-ton pencil. And it was. It was cumbersome. And there was a kind of formality to it. There was what the British called the rostrum camera. You know, just there. And you take a picture. Uh -huh. and, and you can kind of see it in that TV, TV send-up of uh, CBS coverage of the convention uh, with David Schumacher, you know, trying to leave the question up to Cronkite. Did they want to interview Chuck Hall? Uh, that kind of hierarchy and formality was, but that had been broken in film 
1960, when Robert Drew and Al Mazels and Ricky mm -hmm. Leacock and D.A. Um, Pennebaker did primary with Kennedy, and, and um, that was the beginning of American cinema verite. And then the Porter Pack came along uh, mid '60s, and uh, and there was big discussions between uh, film and, and and video. But you know, it's and they each have this. I can't see anything. They each have uh, special properties, but uh, it's for storytelling. Mm -hmm. And I just think we. Uh, what's great about that is people felt free. I mean, I did my best work when I had an idea and I was able to convince somebody of, of the idea, and then I went to do it, and there was not too much interference. And that was, most of it was work for Hunter. And, um, I mean, looking back, it is really incredible that there was a time when resources were available for people to experiment on television. And now that innovation has moved to the space of the internet or the galleries. I'm wondering, like, how, how, how do you feel about that, the, the, the shift? Well, I still think there's a need for uh, a strong, vibrant, creative public television system in this country. I would like to see it. Uh, I'm glad that video's been democratized uh, and that the startup costs are, are relatively low, but it's still very, the finishing is very expensive. Um, and people get into it. In, in various ways, but I think craft is still important. You can't just, uh, I, I once, I did a series after, well, I, I did a 90 minute program for public television um, after 9-11 uh, called New York and Song because we'd been trying to do a cabaret series and um, somebody said to me, you know the trouble with cabaret? And, and we have friends who are going to the cabaret convention tonight <laughs> instead of going here. And, uh, and he said, well, the entry barrier is so low. So that is a problem in, in video, too. But really what's going to happen is that the, you're still going to have the cream rice to the top, hopefully. And more people will have chances, I think. Mm. Well, I'm going to take some questions from the audience and technicians. Can, can you lower these lights? We cannot really see anything. You really can't see anything that's really bright. <laughs> or make the house brighter. And we have mics that we can pass to you if you can just raise your hand. Anyone? Thank you for staying. <laughs> oh, yes. Um, this is a as a documentary uh, capturing so much footage from so many different eras is just a spectacular accomplishment to build a narrative out of so many recollections. So just wondering like how you kind of plan, you know, and, and a lot of the activities, you know, on film look to be very spontaneous and playful, but when you have combined it into what was presented tonight, there's obviously a lot of thought and structure behind that. So could you just you know, comment a little bit about how you outlined uh, what you made as a film before you made it? <laughs> I, it it's, it's sort of a different process. I mean, you, you kind of, you do, you do make lists of things that you want to put in. Uh, I did a 90-minute documentary with Bill Moyers called Sports for Sale, and I remember making a list of every char uh, character that would be involved. And this was done over like a year's time. Uh, and then I realized, well, I've got to combine characters. I can't have this coach and that coach. I have to have a coach, et cetera. And uh, I think with this, I, I, knew, I knew a lot of the people involved in, in many really interesting ways, uh, besides the obvious ways of having worked with them. Uh, I knew who had won awards and I knew who had built extraordinary careers. Uh, I mean, I met Don Misher in Washington before uh, the TV lab ever existed, for example. Uh, and there were people I didn't know. I didn't know Michael Schamberg, but uh, for example, uh, I had friends who did. So, uh, and some people it took longer to get. That's the only advantage of doing something over this length of time, believe me. Um, I mean, 
I wasn't able to get to Diane English till about 2006, and um, but somebody who knew her found me and said she should do it. Um, anyway, so I think I've probably interviewed about 70, 75 people, but I didn't, and I shot most of it myself, which is, is okay for intimacy, but not for quality, and, um, and then hired other people uh, sometimes when it was absolutely essential. Um, and, um, and I think you, you, you gradually shape it. I mean, it's a bit like throwing clay on a, you know, an armature and, and shaping a sculpture. You still see things, and you can't see it, because it is complex, you can't see it all at once. And uh, we made some changes right from the last screening we had, which was uh, just last weekend at Dartmouth. And, but what really, in considerable changes when you first saw it, my God, right? <laughs> right? It was maybe before the summer. Yeah, um, it was before the Asian American International Film Festival yeah. got into their work in progress. And that, uh, that was really important because a lot of filmmakers and people who were involved in the TV lab came. And uh, the feedback you get is really, really important. Because you see things and people say, well, why is that? Is that redundant? Is that... Uh, <laughs> You know, you know I, I, don't, I don't get that. What, I went that to his home and he's like, sit down, give me a notepad and a pen, write your <laughs> comments, take notes. Yeah, yeah. Well, we can't force him to do that. But, but I really do appreciate any comments. Uh, anything that was confusing or anything that seemed redundant? Yes? Yes. Nothing. Could you comment on the uh, significance of that uh, January 1, 1984? The January 1, 1984, good morning, Mr. Orwell. How was that received? Well, you can see that, I think, upstairs. And um, th that was really not part of the TV lab officially. Uh, good morning, Mr. Orwell. Bye-bye, Kipling, and wrap around the world. I think there were three satellite broadcasts, each one getting more complicated and more intricate. Um, and uh, but. but and Peg did the, those with Carol Brandenburg primarily. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Yes. Um, thank you for sharing this wonderful film. Um, thank you. Congratulations on making it. Uh, I'm also a filmmaker, and I wonder if you could discuss uh, some of the perhaps more emotional and uh, motivational aspects of the making a film over such a long period. Mm. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> it's like, it, it, I mean, my favorite quote is when, uh, when I asked uh, uh, Shigeko what, why uh, Pake was nervous, <laughs> why he had a nervous stomach. She said, money. I mean, that is a really big problem. You know, it's, it's a total different approach than if you have I mean, I did a, a two-hour film that had a $1.1 million grant from the uh, Sloan Foundation. It was on online education. And we, all, it, it was actually not enough because we started out, we were supposed to do a 90-minute film, and then we did a two-hour film because that's what public television wanted. And then they wanted it in two different versions. Uh, but the, uh, you hire a team of people. You do the research. You set out a, a production schedule, and you do it. And then you do whatever you need to do in terms of pickup, uh, what, what you don't have or you find. Um, some, it's, um, it's much more impressionistic. Uh, I, it's more organic to do it this way. Uh, I don't, there's some good things about it, but I, I'm not so sure I would recommend it or I would combine uh, <laughs> the two. I, I did three national literacy projects for WQED Pittsburgh that were PBS programs. And the first one we had about five months to do. We were working seven days a week. The next one we had seven uh, months and we were working normally. The third one we had nine months to do and we could do some wonderful little extras. And it was, you know, uh, it was that much better, I thought. Um, but you do, you try to do what you can within the constraints, even if they're not any. And the constraint is always money and time. I mean, to, uh, um, 
I'm, I'm fortunate that a lot of people found me and, and wanted to help uh, at very crucial times. Uh, a lot of students wanted to learn Avid editing. And, and, and by the way, the whole technological change is, is absolutely a huge problem because I was started this in Avid Media Composer and then all of a sudden Final Cut Pro uh, came along and then they weren't teaching Avid at certain universities, so it was harder to find students who would know this. And then when you're working with students, you're maybe working two days a week, not full time. Um, so it's, um, I don't know, it, it's, you just, you do it if you, I, I mean, I, Paik was, I, I should tell you this, that I did a piece for Paik, uh, about Paik for CBS Sunday Morning uh, in 1982 at the time of this Whitney show that we did in Chicago. And uh, after that, my boss at Sunday Morning, Chad Norshield, asked me to introduce him to Paik, so I did. And he hired Peg to do the, uh, the set for a new TV show with Bill Moyers and, and Charles Corral uh, called American Parade. Now, the series only lasted eight episodes, but the video flag that Peg had created was such a hit that three museums wanted to buy it afterwards. So Peg had three versions made and adapted it to the cities where it was sold, uh, L.A. County Museum of Art, Detroit Institute of Arts, uh, Chase Manhattan Bank Collection. And, um, and then he said to me at, at an opening of his at Holly Solomon Gallery that this was the first real money he'd ever made. And, you know, I was glad to have had that effect for him, so it was great. Yeah. <laughs> Can you wait for me? Wait, wait. We're recording, that's why. Um, I, unlike the gentleman in front of me, I come to this not as a filmmaker, but purely as a naive consumer. And Hardly. <laughs> uh, well, no, no. I mean, you understand. Yeah. Um, as I watched this, I saw two, um, two themes. Um, the, uh, the breaking up of traditional representational image through the synthesizer and so forth. But then in the second half, you're really showing us um, documentaries and the effects of the handheld camera. Um, in terms of what ends up on television, is the latter what dominates and the former what people were experimenting with? Uh, well, well, not exactly, as a sort be of because they were, they were interwoven. Uh, I mean, certain. John Alpert and TV TV and Alan Susan Raymond were there and were fully integrated into the whole life cycle of the, of the TV lab. Um, but the video art, as Carol said, that became harder and harder to get resources for. And a, a lot of programs that start out experimental. I was, uh, worked in the second year of the Public Broadcast Laboratory, which was an, another experimental series. And in the first year, it was very experimental and it, more magazine-like in its, in its approach, and then it devolved into documentaries. Uh, part of that is that you can fix the responsibility for, uh, for individual programs. But here you were talking about, uh, I mean, if you're really going to do documentaries, it, there's, you know, there's a huge challenge as, as in, in terms of, it's, it's like not everybody has the fact-checking ability of the New Yorker, for example, you know, in print. So it's, it's really, um, and we, there were a lot of just interesting but not unusual documentaries in the second half. Uh, and, and there were fewer uh, uh, performance, video art programs, et cetera. But... Uh, But anyway, and also, the video art did spread to the galleries more. I, I mean, I don't think the arts are sufficiently covered on television. I mean, if you think, you see the, read the stories about museum attendance in this country, and I believe the last time I saw it, it surpasses sports attendance. Sports has no problem getting covered on, uh, on television, but art does. And I think that's because it, it's, 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 there's losers and it's a confined time. Um, so there are reasons for it, but I don't think that, I think as part of the culture, 
uh, broadcasting in general should be doing more coverage of the arts and more. I mean, um, I saw, I went to a PBS uh, uh, meeting in San Francisco, and they had somebody had a great idea of taking uh, short stories from different cultures and adapting them and making them uh, one-hour television programs. And I saw the pilot, and it was shot in New Jersey with an Indian American community, and it was it was fantastic. Uh, they could never uh, get broad acceptance for that. Um, I think we just we don't fund public television, so uh, which is probably one of the few hopes, or something that's subscription television like like HBO for for a different kind of quality. Uh, you just don't have. Um, the system isn't such that it encourages certain things. But it will evolve. And you know, it takes innovation. And maybe because the tools are, uh, are more available, maybe somebody will do something astounding that will change how we, and I hope they will. I hope that seeing these things, they will, somebody will get an idea and say, I know what I want to do, and, and go do it. That, that's the whole reason for doing this. You know, just like. Uh, artists study art history and then they build upon it. You want to, uh, students of media in every aspect to be able to build on that. There's one question over there. Can you use the mic, please? Um, what influenced you to go into film and video? <laughs> well, it's funny you should ask. I was, I was just at my... Um, Alma mater, uh, Dartmouth College, and um, the, the um, while I was there, I had to make a choice. Was I going to be a, a photo I was a photographer for the yearbook, and I was a reporter for an editor for the newspaper, and I had to make a choice which one I was going to succeed in a management position to, and I became editor of the Dartmouth. But I took a course, uh, the sociology course, and. I had an assignment to uh, put together a slideshow with different narration. Same pictures, different narration. And I was so intrigued by that, and I thought, wow, I wonder if these pictures could move and we could do something. So uh, as it happened, uh, I went to the Soviet Union with, I, I had the, fir the first pictures were from a, from a trip I took on a Scandinavian student travel uh, tour of the Soviet Union. and. Then I, uh, there was a wonderful man who, who taught, uh, who, who shot footage for Dartmouth and was covered Dar Dartmouth College Films. He ran the Dartmouth College Film Society. And years, years later, I saw that he was in the World War II fighter squadron with uh, Robert Drew. And his name was Blair Watson. And he sort of gave me instant lessons in how to use a camera, how to shoot film. And, and I, had the lowest shooting ratio I've ever had in my life, 1.3 to 1. And I came back with this footage uh, from a trip to Russia that we raised money for in, in the spring of 62, edited it together, and showed that at the college. And uh, he took it to something called the University Film Producers Association, where it won an award as one of the outstanding collegiate films of 61, 62. And I was already a reporter at the Washington Post and headed to law school at Stanford. But I knew Stanford had a good broadcasting and film program. So if I didn't like law school, which I didn't, I went into <laughs> broadcasting and film, and that led to everything else. I mean, but I think, you know, if somebody says, hey, you're good at something, and you have some tangible evidence of it, I think that's a path that you're encouraged to pursue. And that's what happened to me. There's a question here. Thank you for thank you for uh, documenting this journey, and uh, my question is: uh, the pioneers of this effort uh, were young when when they when they uh, started. They had the daring, the, the maybe the vision uh, to do what they did, and and I was, I'm just wondering how we, your impression would be, uh, would be of the young people today. Uh, have they come to really benefit? Uh, um, from the efforts of, of those who came before them, because today uh, some young people are characterized as 
being distracted by so many things, including social media. Mm. You know, the tools are here. I mean, they've come. Uh, they're fabulous tools. But does it help them think better? You know, uh, uh, because I presume one effort of this whole thing is to make people think and see things in a, uh, you know, an improved way. Well, I've, I've seen a few things. There was an interesting program uh, at the New Museum recently, and um, there was some, uh, met some young people who were uh, really developing tools and doing things uh, in a creative way today. Uh, I don't know the field. I mean, one of the things that would be interesting to explore would be to have a, an, a panel or, or an exhibition or something of the most interesting things being done t uh, today. Uh, I, I have gone to things where I've seen work that I think is somewhat repetitive, and, and so I think that's the more that somebody can learn about what's gone before and then explore, um, I think it's all the better. One final over there. Hi, I want to thank you for uh, sticking with this project over the years. I am uh, I'm David Loxton's son. Oh, oh my God. And, uh, Final question. <laughs> That's fantastic. And uh, I'm, I'm here tonight with uh, my mom, his widow. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, f I feel this, uh, this story, you know, PBS did its six hour whatever retrospective mm -hmm. on the history of PBS a couple years ago. And, and they did, I think, three or four minutes on the TV lab. and. Uh, I really tried for them to. <laughs> I, I know. I, know. <laughs> I really tried. I couldn't do it. But uh, I, f I feel this story was just about to sort of drop off the radar of history, and and mm. and you stuck with it. And since uh, we're doing a Q and A here, I guess the question is, what about this story captured your imagination, and 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 why did you stick with it and made sure that it got told? Well, I I did manage to get interviewed for a couple of minutes. And all he wanted to talk to me about was the Cabot show, but uh, where I was executive producer of that. But uh, when I first went over, it was in 73. I'd known Paik when I was at a, uh, Channel 7 Eyewitness News. And before then, uh, I went over to, uh, to work for Bill Moyer's Journal. And I thought, oh, I'm 33 years old. I've actually achieved my goal of making documentaries for the network. Isn't this terrific? And, uh, and then he quit. And so, but I got the chance to design a program with Studs Terkel, and also with uh, Doris Kearns, George Will, and Maya Angelou. And, it, and because I came up with the idea that we were going to do half hour programs, and in those days they'd already sold the Moyers show to the system, and that's how it worked. It's, it doesn't work that way now. So they had to have a program, and I came up with this program, and I said, if, if we link issues with people, there'll be a continuity, and you'll be able to do it what you could do in before in six days, you could do in three days, whatever. And so we did some really interesting programs there. And then they weren't going to continue that. But they were going to start uh, a new program, which was the Robert McNeil Report. And I produced the very first show of that. And then it became the McNeil Lair, et cetera, et cetera. And after uh, three years, they wanted me to, to become executive producer of the DeCavit Show. And again, try to enhance the show, which is not what he wanted to do, but we did. And, and then I went back to work for Moyers. And then I, Ronald Reagan got elected, and I said, I think public television's in trouble. So I uh, worked freelance for CBS Sunday Morning, and then they hired me to a five-year contract. And then, uh, then I worked for about a year and a half for 60 Minutes, and then back to Sunday Morning, and then they went through and fired 215 people in a single day at, at CBS. And then I wound up doing these uh, literacy shows and working at uh, Live from Lincoln Center with Pavarotti, et, et cetera, et cetera. Um, oh, by the way, now let me just tell you something that's really important. This is because, because it's your father. Um, so I'm searching and searching for, for footage of him, right? And I find the only live action footage I can find is in this West German television program, WDR, which was done uh, about the Bell Labs and about the TV lab and a lot of interesting creative things. But as soon as he starts speaking, there's a German translation. <laughs> and I could not get a clear answer from anybody as to whether that existed. 
But if you had a budget and you had people working for you, you would send them out and say, go get that and pin it down definitively. And I know people in, in, in Germany, I could ask to do it in the whole thing. I mean, one of the, my great disappointments in searching for this was I read a print reference to the fact that somebody had, had made a f film for USIA about Nam June Paik creating Global Groove in Studio 46. And I was like, oh my god, that would just be the holy grail. That'd be so fantastic. And so I, they had the weirdest thing that the National Archives and Records Administration will not make you a copy of something that's in their catalog. You have to send somebody to make a dub. I, I mean, the control on there is, really is puzzling. So I had a friend at CNN who uh, we'd worked together on uh, the Robert McNeil show, and she knew somebody who had done this a few times, had gone to the uh, National Archives. So he goes, makes a tape, and I think it was 250 bucks or something, I paid him, and, and he comes back, and it's like an insert reel. It's not what, what's described. And I'm like, I can't believe this. What happened to it? Did somebody steal it? Did, did they, you know, was it lost? Who? Um, and it's, it's just, you know, that's the mystery. You know, and, and you can't, you cannot do it if you don't have really sustained effort. And I don't know, but uh, but that's uh, that's still a mystery. So we were able to find this one little piece where he actually says, "This is Ed Amschwiller that we we used to to fit it over," but. Yeah, that's, thank you for coming. Well, before we all leave, yeah. yes. just tell us what's, hap what's going to happen to the film. Are you done? No, no, no. <laughs> I mean, I even saw a few things I want to change right here. And, and we changed a few things um, even since the show. That's why you got yeah. it just before, uh, yeah, since we showed it last the weekend. I, a little hairy, yes, I know. <laughs> but, um, each time you see, it's like, I want to have a sustained effort to get things done, but also I, I want to uh, have the resources to uh, do a, a fair use evaluation. Uh, some rights we have already agreed to you know, purchase, um, and then to, uh, uh, to do all the technical things. I mean, it, we, you, this looks basically pretty good, but it can look better, and it can sound better, uh, and that's that's expensive. But uh, this whole finishing process is a big deal. Yeah, I mean, and then you want to promote it, and you want to make sure that uh, the people who need to see it, and you know who ought to see it, can see it. Whether it will go on television, I'm not sure. Maybe Netflix will. Well, Howard, thank you so much, and thank best you. wishes. Thank you. Oh, I, would, I want to say, Law's belief in this, from when she saw it at an early stage, and believe me, it was pretty ragged, has really been very, very important to me. When she said it was a, it's not the early stage. <laughs> no, it wasn't the early stage, but, but, but you know, it was. She said that uh, it was an important uh, video history, and I, that was very important to me. Yeah. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you.